All right. I'm going to start a minute early because I've got a lot to cover today. <laughs> and 45 minutes is not a lot of time. So uh, we'll get started. So, hey, welcome to my talk, Management Hacking 102. So how many of you saw part one of this last year at B-Sides? One or two of you? Okay. All right. Cool. So, so this is actually the continuation of my first talk which uh, was Management Hacking 101, uh, where we covered kind of the basics of management and leadership. Um, but this talk, I wanted to go a little bit deeper into a couple areas that I feel are really important for all managers, whether you are new in management or leadership or you've been around the block a lot of, for a while. Um, topics such as personalities, personality types, so learning about yourself and learning about others. We're gonna talk about empathy, and why that's so important to lead with empathy, especially in this industry. Um, and we will talk about difficult conversations, um, which is a, I think, maybe the most important topic um, that we'll cover. Um, but also we'll sprinkle in a couple other things around managing change. So we'll go through something called the change cycle, um, as well as we'll talk about motivation and what motivates you and your teams. So just a recap of uh, Management 101. So we talked a lot about your role as a leader and setting expectations, listening, communication, giving feedback, what's the components of a, a great team. Um, we also dived into kind of performance management. So areas of like, you know, how do you manage the performance of a team, just kind of from a basic level. Um, emotional intelligence, which is extremely important uh, in leadership and team management. Um, and then finally, we kind of wrapped it up with coaching and um, we did talk a little bit about motivation and personalities, um, but this talk really is gonna go a li lot deeper into those two topics specifically. So you can check out the full presentation Presentation. It's up on YouTube. It's also on my blog, spylogic.net. So what is this talk about? So like I mentioned, we're going to go a lot deeper into people and personalities. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about motivation, the different types of motivation and motivators, um, and what motivates yourself and your team. And then empathy. I think this is huge. Empathy is something that we need much more of in this industry and frankly, the entire world. So we're going to talk about how to be more empathetic um, and to lead with empathy. Um, what's brand new? So two topics in particular I added to this was dealing with change. So how do we take ourselves and our team through the change cycle, which we'll go through, um, and then having difficult conversations. Who likes having difficult conversations? Really? <laughs> well, it's important to have difficult conversations, but they are very, very challenging. So um, we'll talk about a framework uh, that you can use for really any difficult conversation. So even if it's outside of work, you can apply these things, actually more than difficult conversations, all the things I'm talking about today will apply to your personal life and personal relationships as well, which is pretty cool. So just a little bit about me. So uh, my name is Tom Esten. I'm the VP of Consulting and Cosmos Delivery at Bishop Fox. Um, I'm, a, I'm a United States Marine Corps veteran uh, from back in the day. Um, I started my career over 18 years ago. Um, and I just checked the other day. I've actually been in IT and technology for about 24 years. So I'm like really old <laughs> when I think about it. Um, but it's been great. I've, I've started out as you know, uh, a help desk technician, break fix, you know, laptops and that kind of thing. And then ended up in security, um, forming kind of the first security team at a company that I worked at um, back in the day when it was called InfoSec before it was even cybersecurity um, and got a lot of experience uh, that way. And then just through the years, I uh, got into consulting. I led and managed various teams. Um, uh, even before that, I was a pen tester, so um, I kind of understood the industry and offensive security early on. Um, I became a director and now I'm a VP. So I've had a lot of great experience over the years and I've got lots of stories that I'll be sharing in this talk as well. Um, and hopefully those stories will also resonate with you. And then I'm also the founder and co-host of the Shared Security Podcast. Um, I've been doing that for 14 years, hard to believe. Um, so if you're looking for a security podcast, uh, you can find us wherever you like to listen to your podcasts. So let's talk about personalities. So why do we want to understand someone's personality? 
Well, first and foremost, it's really about discovering each person's unique way of receiving communication. So we're all different based on our personality type. And so once we understand the personality type of ourselves and others, we can craft our message and our communication in the right way. So the, so the people that we're talking to will actually understand and comprehend what we're saying. It also allows us to become more empathetic we reduce conflict, we find common ground with each other once we understand personality types. And honestly, it's about your own growth as well. So the more that you discover about yourself and who you are, the better person, the better leader that you can become. So I kind of put this quote in here, um, and I've seen this throughout my career. Once you understand people's personalities, it's, it's something magical will kind of happen on a team. When everybody has had kind of training and understanding around personality types, you really can start bonding with, with the team. You start seeing improvements in a lot of areas, um, and it's mainly around communication. You all just become better communicators. So what's the first step? in terms of learning about personality types? Well, you have to start with yourself. Um, and that is really the first step here. And how you do that is there are several different types of personality t uh, tests that are out there. Um, and in this, in this talk, we're gonna cover the uh, four most popular types that you'll probably encounter. So there's the Myers-Briggs, which we'll go in depth about, the Enneagram, the DISC, and then my favorite, which is the Process Communication Model, or also known as PCM. Now, as I go through these, what you're gonna find is that there are some similarities between all of them. And that's kind of the cool thing about this. There isn't like one personality test that I would recommend saying, yep, you got to do Myers-Briggs and that's it. I recommend kind of looking at all of them and then seeing kind of which one resonates with you the most. For me personally and for others I've talked to, it's been the PCM, um, but others kind of resonate more with uh, the Myers-Briggs, which is obviously one of the most popular ones that are out there. So as I go through these, kind of look for those similarities. You might find it really interesting. So Myers-Briggs, um, this is based on the theory um, which is proposed by Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung back in 1921. Um, so Catherine Cooks Briggs and her daughter Isabel Myers-Briggs, they created this indicator assessment which is known as the MBTI. This is back in 1943 during World War II because they needed women to enter the workforce because of the um, you know, the building of tanks and ammunition and guns and everything needed for World War II. So kind of a historical fact that these two women were innovators getting women into the workforce, which is pretty cool. So Myers-Briggs, the Myers-Briggs type indicator is based on four dichotomies that match up to 16 different personality types, which is indicated by a code with four letters. So you've probably seen these codes and letters and people talking about them. We'll, we'll kind of go through what those codes mean. So the first one is called favorite world. So do you prefer to focus on the outer world or do you prefer your inner world? This is called, called extroversion or introversion. So we all have that type. Next is information. So do you prefer to focus on the basic information you take in or do you prefer to interpret and add meaning? This is called sensing or intuition. Decisions, so when making decisions, do you prefer to first look at logic and consistency or look at the people and special circumstances? This is called thinking or feeling. And then lastly, structure. So in dealing with things in the outside world, do you prefer to get things decided or do you prefer to stay open to new information and options? This is called judging or perceiving. So when looking at your own personality type, there's a test that you can take obviously that will kind of match you up, but just by reading this, you can probably figure out maybe where you land. Uh, we all kind of know, do we prefer extroversion or introverts? Or introverts? Um, you'll look at your team, you'll kind of understand, is someone more shy or quiet? Maybe they're a little introverted, someone that talks a lot or likes to be involved in activities, they're probably more extroverted. So for me, um, I am an ENTJ, which is organized, confident, and sometimes impatient and stubborn. <laughs> but I also kind of float a little bit between uh, ESTJ, which is practical, realistic, uh, sometimes insensitive, and, and I can be argumentative. So um, what's interesting about Myers-Briggs, there's lots of different material that's out there, too. So um, I'll have a link to all the notes from this um, with some good reference guides and books and other materials if you're interested in learning more about Myers-Briggs.
Next up is the Enneagram. So the Enneagram is actually goes, it's potentially, there's a little bit debate in the community about this, but it may go back to fourth century Egypt. So it's one of the oldest types of uh, known uh, typology uh, around personality types that's been out there. Um, so you may hear people talk about with the Enneagram, I'm a three or I'm a six or I'm a one. And we're going to go through all of those. They go from one through nine. Um, and again, this is another type of uh, popular personality indicator that's out there. So first is the reformer. So these are people that are rational. They're very idealistic. Um, they're self-controlled and, and may be a perfectionist. Um, the helper, this is the caring person, the interpersonal type. They're very generous, people-pleasing, uh, and sometimes possessive. Uh, the achiever, so this is the success-oriented, pragmatic type. They're excel, they're driven, um, they're very image conscious. So I'm actually an achiever. That's my Enneagram type. There's the individualist, so this is the person that's maybe sensitive, they're very withdrawn, um, sometimes dramatic and self-absorbed, uh, and temperamental. Um, the investigator, so this is someone that is intense, they're the cerebral type, they're perceptive, they're secretive, and somewhat isolated. The loyalist, so they're committed, security oriented type, they're responsible, anxious, and sometimes suspicious. The enthusiast busy, fun-loving type, very spontaneous, uh, distractible, and sometimes scattered. The challenger, the powerful, dominating type. They're very self-confident, decisive, willful, and, and often confrontational. And then lastly, the peacemaker. So this is someone who's easygoing, um, they're reassuring, they're agreeable, and complacent. So there's different types of these Enneagram tests that are available, but I do want to call out that the most popular one is called the Rizzo-Hudson Enneagram type, and I'll have a link to uh, a really good book that talks about this uh, in a little more detail. Next up is the DISC. So this was created in uh, 1928 by psychologist Dr. William Moulton Martson. And DISC is really a behavioral theory that describes personality through these four central traits. So first is dominance. So a person high in dominance wants, to be, wants others to be direct, to the point, open, straightforward, and they want to focus on, on results. Influence, so they like to be emotionally honest, friendly, they have a sense of humor. Steadiness, they want you to be agreeable, cooperative, and show appreciation from them. And then conscientiousness, these are people that are detail-oriented and they want others to be accurate and pay attention to detail and minimize socializing. So kind of having seen all these personality types so far, you can start seeing some similarities based on uh, what we've already shown. But back in the 1940s, there was actual, an actual test that was created for this um, to, to help identify what traits that uh, you align with. Um, DISC is really popular in the business world, I found. Um, I learned about DISC many years ago uh, at a job that I had, and this is the one I kind of come back to as well, because it's very simple uh, to understand. And again, like the others, there's multiple sources and interpretations of DISC. DISC in particular can be interpreted in a lot of different ways, but this is kind of the most common interpretation that I'm sharing with you here. Oh, and by the way, I am uh, a D, so I'm more uh, on the dominant side, but I also float a little bit um, with the C is, uh, is my DISC type. So the last one I want to share is, and my favorite, is the process communication model. So this was created by American clinical psychologist Tabley Collar um, back in the 1970s, and it was created for NASA. So this is actually the personality test that was used to uh, determine who's on the flight crew for like the space shuttle and the other programs. Because you can think about it, right? You probably want, you know, whoever's the mission controller or the mission commander to be of a certain personality type when things start going wrong <laughs> in space, right? You probably don't want your social butterfly in charge of the, uh, the uh, spacecraft. So um, we're gonna go through the six different personality types around this. Um, and these actually really resonate with most people once they see them for the first time. Um, and what's interesting about PCM is that we all have a little bit of each of these six types, but we are dominant in one of them. And they call that the base. So it actually goes from bottom to up. And I'll show you an example of what that looks like. 
So first is the promoter. So these are people that are very action oriented, adaptable, per persuasive and charming. Their traits, they have the ability to be very firm and direct. Um, the question they like to ask themselves is, am I alive? And some examples from movies or, or TV. So James Bond, um, Sean Connery is the best James Bond, by the way, just my personal opinion. Um, Captain Jack Sparrow uh, and Tony Stark from Iron Man. The rebel. So the rebel reacts to people and things with likes and dislike. These are the fun loving, spontaneous, they're creative, they're playful, they're always telling jokes, everything's kind of fun and funny. Um, their traits are, they like to see the humor in things and they live in the present. So the question they like to ask themselves is, is am I acceptable? And so movie TV personalities, so Captain Kirk from Star Trek, uh, Tiffany, uh, who was played by Jennifer Lawrence in Silver Lang's Playbook, and then my favorite, uh, Jeffrey Lebowski, uh, which was Jeff Bridges in The Big Lebowski. I love The Big Lebowski. Such a great movie. Thinker. So this is someone who thinks first. They identify and categorizes peoples and people and things. They are very responsible, logical, and organized. Their traits, they think logically. They take in all the facts, ideas, um, before usually making a decision. They really want to think about things before moving forward with something. The question they ask themselves is, am I competent? So movie P TV person examples, Spock. Perfect example of that from Star Trek. Aaron Brockovich, who was played by Julia Roberts. Um, and then Monica Geller, for any of you that are Friends fans, that would be Courtney Cox uh, on Friends. The Harmonizer. So Harmonizers are people, pe people, people, people. Uh, they love to uh, relate to people instead of things. So they're social, they're creative, compassionate, and caring people, right? They're your social butterflies. They always want to work in groups and be around people. They get energy from being around people. Um, and they're also really good at bringing people together um, and adapt at those social skills of organizing teams. So the question they ask themselves is, am I appreciated? And a great movie TV person example is Sam from The Lord of the Rings. So Lord of the Rings, again, another great movie. Now the persister. Let's talk about them for a minute. So uh, these are your judgy people. Um, they judge first and they evaluate people on things with rather strong opinions sometimes. They're very opinionated people. They're dedicated though, they're observant, and they're conscientious. So their traits is they will, they have the ability to give opinions, beliefs, and judgments sometimes unwanted. And, you know, that's okay. Um, but the question they ask themselves is, am I right and am I valued? So uh, the movie TV personality I like to call out is Dwight from The Office. Any Office fans? Yeah, he's totally the persister. <laughs> so last is the imaginer. So these people are very reflective and they're motivated into action by things and people. So they're reflective, they're calm, they're reserved. They're kind of your quiet and shy type, very introverted. Um, I find that we have a lot of imaginers in uh, cybersecurity um, and it's not a bad thing. Um, it's just a lot of people like this like to work alone. They don't like workplace drama. They're the type that says, just leave me alone. Let me do my work. Um, and they're very introspective, right? They, they work very well with things like repetitive tasks. We see this a lot in consulting. There's a lot of people who just like to do the same type of work over and over, and they're very good at what they do. Um, but the question they ask themselves is, am I wanted? And uh, the best movie TV personality example, I think, is Forrest Gump, just a perfect example of a true imaginer. So here's my PCM results. Um, and like I mentioned, it starts from the bottom up. So I am a high thinker followed by a promoter and then a harmonizer. And the last uh, personality type I resonate with is an imaginer. What's interesting though, is that I actually see myself in all of these 
And this week is a great example of that. So I'm going to be in Vegas for five days of doing very extroverted things like what I'm doing now. But I'll tell you what, I'm going to lock myself in a room for like three days after this. And I just want to be by myself. I don't want any other distractions. I want to kind of detox myself from just being so extroverted all week. And that's okay, right? But it's interesting and and kind of think about where you hit on some of these levels. Um, And again, I'll have some links um, that it'll take you to where you can get the test for this as well as some additional reading materials if you're interested. I think it's great. So let's talk about motivation. Who knows of a guy called David Goggins? Few of you? Yep. Do you think David is crazy? (laughs) Yeah, he's kind of crazy. But he is one of the most motivating uh, individuals that I have, um, I've read about and follow like on social media. Um, He's kind of like a drill instructor in some ways. He's a former Navy SEAL. He's been through a lot in his life. Um, But, uh, and he does crazy things like running a hundred mile race on a broken foot, right? Just masochistic type stuff. But but what I like about David is the message that he, he brings, which is about, you know, here he talks about motivation. It's kind of crap. It comes and goes, but it's about being driven. And I, I take this as a leader is we're all here to motivate our employees so they become driven, right? So they literally destroy the things that they're working on, right? Uh, maybe not physically destroy, right? But actually have that drive in them to be motivated. So all of us as leaders, that's our job, right? How do we find out what motivates our teams, how to get them motivated to, to do great things? So everybody, including ourselves, has different ways that we like to be motivated, and we have to either ask them or we have to determine what those motivators are. So, And this is really how they are energized and how we achieve results. But think for a minute what motivates you. Is it money? Is it promotions? Is it titles? Is it uh, grandiose things? Is it gifts? We all have these different things, or is it just a simple thank you? Um, A lot of us just have different, we all have different types of ways we're motivated. So let's get into how people are motivated. So there's two typical types of motivators. There's intrinsic and extrinsic motivators. So intrinsic is about uh, autonomy, so belonging, curiosity, They want to feel love, learning, and mastery, um, and they want to have meaning in their work. Extrinsic people are more focused on competition. They like getting badges. They have a fear of failure, fear of punishment in some ways. So like if you're motivated by like those workouts where you got somebody yelling at you constantly and that works for you, you're probably more of an extrinsic type of motivation person. Gold stars, money, points, rewards, those are all things that kind of fall into those categories. So that kind of leads to talking about this theory called uh, McClellan's Human Motivation Theory, which uh, is really based on three things, which is achievement, affiliation, and power. So what's interesting about this is just like in the personality types, everybody has uh, a focus uh, in terms of the ways that they like to be motivated. So as I go through these three, think about which ones uh, you might resonate more with and your team. So the achievement-oriented person. So how do you know you've encountered someone that is uh, an achievement person? So they're competitive, right? They're, com- they're concerned about outperform- outperforming someone else. Um, they want to be involved in unique or very innovative uh, accomplishments. And they want to advance their career or they have a long-term achievement goal. So these are the people that say, I want to be a director in three years. I want to be the CEO. I want to do this. They usually have a plan in place of what steps they're going to take to get to that next level. The behaviors you'll see, so they get energy from working towards goals and they take moderate risks. Um, They want personal responsibility. And the big thing with achievement people is they want feedback, right? They want frequent and very specific feedback about their work they're doing, how good of a job they're doing. Um, This is very important for the achievement oriented person. Um, and they'll get very frustrated when they're unable to get data or results. And they typically will choose experts over friends to work with. So uh, how do you motivate someone uh, with the achievement motive? Well, you want to allow opportunities for them to work alone, 
um, and be responsible for very challenging tasks. So some techniques you could use, um, be a coach. So define those job responsibilities and those goals, delegate responsibility, um, negotiate on those performance outcomes, and then provide access to experts. Next is the affiliation motive. So how do you know? Well, these are people concerned with uh, they're about being disliked, disapproved of, or rejected. So their interest is a concern for others. Belonging to a group is important, um, and they perceive setting as setting as a social situation conductive to friendship. So these are your people, 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 right? They love being in groups. They love organizing groups, and they really want to be around people. So they they get their energy around people, they look to make friends at work. So these are the people that usually in a go, hey, can we go get a drink after work with the team? Uh, can we socialize? Can we hang out? Um, sometimes they put people before actual tasks, so that's something to know about. Um, and they may take negative feedback personally. So even if you're giving a feedback, uh, you're having a feedback session with, with them, they may be like, ooh, like that really hurts. And then you as a leader need to kind of overcome that and tell them like, it's not that bad. Um, so they're very interesting people. These are kind of your social butterflies. How do you motivate them? Well, obviously give them opportunities to work in groups, give them the opportunity to create groups where they can work together with others, praise them for good work, um, assign them jobs that allows them to help others, um, and, provide, and provide group incentives as well. So anything around social events, parties, these uh, uh, affiliation people love that stuff. Power motive. So let's talk about people with the power motive. Now there's two, there's two things about power people you have to understand. There's good power and then there's bad power. So that's kind of called positive and negative. So power people on the positive side, they kind of use that influence uh, for the benefit of the greater good, right? These are kind of your historical great leaders, right? That have done amazing things uh, in history, right? Um, they're, they're very dominant on that dominant side and they're very influential um, and they can do good things. But on the negative side, you'll see people that may be more selfish, more narcissistic, um, also very influential, um, but have a tendency to go more on the negative side. So you also may see power people kind of play both of them. So a little bit good, a little bit bad, and they're trying to find that balance. This is a real struggle for a lot of power people. Um, and unfortunately, we see a lot of um, bad examples in the world. I won't mention any, but you could probably all guess who, maybe in politics or other areas that may be more on the negative side. So their behaviors, they get energy from influencing other people and outcomes. Um, they want to influence, they want to have an impact. Um, they love public attention um, and they do things to enhance their status, right? And again, keeping in mind that they're not all narcissists necessarily, right? But they could easily float into, the, into that danger zone, so to speak. So for power people, you want to give them opportunities to work through uh, you know, or give them opportunities to impact others, positions of influence, authority, leadership. Um, you, know, you definitely want to give them decision-making authority um, in their area of expertise. Um, and oftentimes they're looking for titles, offices, insignia, public recognition, very important for power motive people. Um, they also provide inspiration through identity of working on a great cause, right? Give them something awesome to work on, something that's really important for the company. Power people will love that. So now I want to talk about empathy. And this is really important because I think that, and as the quote from Plato here, everyone's fighting a battle. You may not know it, you may not see it, but everyone has some type of personal struggle going on. And for me, in my career, um, this kind of came to a head at one of my previous jobs where I had, I had an employee that was uh, started out as a total rock star, just an amazing pen tester, totally just five star individual. Slowly his performance started declining over a period of a couple months and I couldn't figure out like what's going on. Like he was going dark, I couldn't contact him. We were all working remote of course, so it was really hard to kind of follow up and have one-on-ones. And 
uh, one day I got, uh, we were literally at the point where we got to let this guy go. Um, we're going to have to put him on a pip. You know, he's just not going to be working here anymore um, because of his performance. And I got a phone call from his wife saying that um, his wife found him passed out on his desk and uh, nearly dead. And they called 911, got him to the hospital and came to find out he was a diabetic. He was having a diabetic episode um, and he didn't know he was diabetic. And uh, it was one of those things I realized I'm like, wow, I thought that it was just his performance that was going downhill but I didn't realize that he was struggling with his health. And that me, that for me taught me a little bit of empathy, right? Like I have to see through that. And once he got the help he needed, he was again, back up to being that star pen tester. Um, and I showed him a lot of empathy for his situation and talked with his wife. Um, but like I said, we just don't know what people are going through. And so we have to think about that and put ourselves in their shoes. So what is empathy? So it's the ability to sense others' feelings and perspectives, and it's really taking an active interest in the concern of others. The important thing here is empathy is not the same as sympathy. It's very, very different. Um, it literally is a step beyond sympathy where you're really feeling what that person is going through. And by becoming more empathetic, I think we can really build stronger relationships with in our personal relationships with our teams. Um, it really can go a long way. And I think we all just need to learn to lead with more empathy. So here's some situations I've encountered. Um, maybe some of you have encountered um, as a manager or leader. Um, you know, there's obviously the typical employee history with a negative performance or they have a poor attitude. Um, they may have opposing views maybe on a particular project um, or something that should be managed. And empathy gets really hard when like something triggers you, right? You have a, per a personal trigger, right? That somebody has said something to you and you're like, oh, that's it. I'm going off, right? Um, or there's a conflict with something that you strongly believe in, um, or you're emotionally drained, you're overwhelmed, or you're in a very stressful or high pressure situation. These are all things that it becomes very difficult to show and have empathy, but we can overcome that. So how do you become more empathetic? So first and foremost, perform active listening. So active listening is about paraphrasing and restating how they're feeling where you ask questions and you summarize information back to the person. So active listening is definitely one of those skills that definitely can be learned, um, but it's so important that when someone says something to you, you're telling them, I understand you and you're repeating it back to them. We all want to hear that we are understood. Put yourself in their shoes, right? Ask them questions to, to talk about their family life. Talk about what's going on at home. You have to try to open them up to discuss like what is really making them tick and what maybe are the issues that they're having that then they might be, be bringing into the workplace. Um, identify common ground if you can. I know that's hard, especially in this politically charged climate, but um, we have to try to just find those, those common ground and understand different perspectives on things. People have just naturally different perspectives than us. So we have to try to really understand that. And again, by, act, by asking questions and performing that active listening is one way you can do that. And then the language you use is important too. So saying things like, wow, that must be challenging for you. Or, you know, I know how you feel. I've been through the exact same thing. And then maybe telling a story of how something you went through was very similar to what they're going through can really go a long way. And last, you want to be curious, right? That's all about asking questions and don't be judgmental. So hold that back, right? We don't want to be uh, judgmental and we don't want to be the persisters or the Dwight's in, uh, in these empathetic situations. So I hate to bring it to you all that um, change uh, is coming. <laughs> you cannot stop the change train, right? I think it's like death, taxes, and change. Those three things are always going to happen. So um, especially now, like I just heard about, you know, more layoffs in the industry. There's lots of things going on. So um, I want to take you through the six changes of the change cycle. And so hope this will probably help you as you go through change. So change is hard, right? Um, everyone processes change a little bit differently. Um, and honestly, performance will suffer on teams. Your own performance will suffer as well. Um, 
because it's your job to get you and your team through these changes. So don't forget about yourself. We all have to process the same change that maybe our teams are going through. So I want to quickly go through the six changes of the change cycle. Um, this is kind of a well-known thing. You can kind of Google this and you'll find different versions of it, but this is essentially the same. Um, so we'll talk about what you're going to see, what you're going to hear, and then what you should do for each stage of the change cycle. So first, first and foremost is stage one, when the change happens. This is what you're going to see. You're going to see people avoiding, withdrawing, acting suspicious of others. You're going to hear things like, this isn't fair. Why me? I don't know or who, I don't know what to believe. This can't be happening. You're going to hear a lot of distress. But the things you should do is remain calm, first and foremost, and show empathy for the situation. Listen, let them talk about their concerns. Clearly define what happened and kind of like, this is how you're going to move forward. This is what happened. This is the change. Address what's the worst that can happen and can we live with it? And then ensure that ongoing two-way communication. It's so important that as a leader, you're constantly staying in communication with your team as you're going through these changes. Stage two is you're moving from doubt to reality. So you're going to see a me versus them mentality, defensiveness, blaming, a lot of judgmental and negative comments. You're going to hear this makes no sense. They don't know what they're doing. Management sucks. They're terrible. You're going to hear all this stuff. Um, do they know how this is going to impact us? But what you do, again, address all questions, concerns, determine what relevant information is missing, um, define that current reality, right? The change has already happened. We got to start moving on, um, but continue that ongoing two-way communication. Stage three is discomfort to motivation. So you'll start seeing a little fr less frustration, maybe some anxiety, lowered productivity. Um, people are really burnt out. They're tired. They still can't make sense of the change. But this is where you need to step in as a leader, provide some direction. You may have to somewhat micromanage a little bit at that time. I'm very much against micromanagement, but in a big change that happens, sometimes you have to step in, help out, um, do more directive type things, um, assist people in prioritizing their work, um, create maybe some informal or formal distractions, get the team together, go out for a drink, something like that, and then continue that two-way communication. Now, this is important. There's something called the danger zone, and you you and your team may actually go back to stage one where you're just going to say, ah, I'm just going to give up. There's nothing I can do. And you'll see a lot of things where people will say, yeah, I'm fine. Everything's good, when in reality, they're not okay, um, and they are back to stage one. So you're going to hear some more neg negativity. But what you should do is just help them identify um, that root cause of feelings from fear to discomfort, encourage more dialogue, um, and then be really sensitive to their, their needs, right? Show more empathy and you'll get them out of stage one again. Stage four is uh, discovery to perspective. So you'll see people offering new ideas. They're gonna start identifying solutions to maybe some problems that were encountered during the change. And you're gonna see a lot more energy. So you'll hear, I see lots of options. I'm actually excited about the new things that we can do. And this might be the best for all of us, right? So what you should do, keep encouraging that idea sharing and possible solutions, identify good decision-making strategies, and then move away from that micromanagement. Don't need that anymore. Number five is understanding the benefits. So you're going to see productivity increases, determination, teamwork, pride. People will say, I finally feel good about this. This makes sense. Uh, I couldn't see it before, but I actually see how this can work now. And then you should acknowledge results and productivity, encourage mentoring, and lastly, celebrate progress, right? Everyone's doing a great job getting through the change. Stage six is now what's called integration. So you'll see excitement, you'll see mentoring, positive attitude. You'll know that you're through the change. People will talk about what they learned. It was tough, but we made it. Um, and it was for the best, right? Um, so continue to acknowledge what happened, acknowledge those good change skills, know what was done well, maybe do a retro, talk about what we, you know, what we could do better next time. And that's when you know you're through those changes. So real quick, just to finish up on change, um, one thing I want to call out from this slide in particular is oftentimes as leaders, we want to just charge in and try to fix things because we think we have the solution. That would not be a good idea when your teams are going through change. So kind of hold back, right? Avoid being defensive. Um, avoid assuming the worst. Kind of check your attitude at the door. I found that, um, you know, we're just trying to fix things when in fact we just have to continue to lead our teams through that change. 
So the last topic I'm going to talk about today is difficult conversations, and this is important. So I love this quote, and I have a link to this book, which is, I think is the best book on difficult conversations by Douglas Stone. Um, often we go through an entire conversation or indeed entire relationship without ever realizing that each of us is paying attention to different things, that our views are based on different information. So how many times have we gotten into an argument with somebody and we didn't have all the information? or we made assumptions about their intent, or we found something out later after the argument happened that, damn, I didn't know that. Like, it happens all the time. And this applies to any kind of relationship, whether it's work or personal. So I wanna talk about uh, how a strategy around difficult conversations and something that you can use to kind of get us through that. So what is a difficult conversation? Well, it's anything that you find hard to talk about, right? So this comes when we enter this thing called a difficulty dilemma. So do you avoid a situation or do you confront it? Um, there's no easy answer, but I will tell you, and I'm sure many of you know this, that if you avoid a difficult conversation, things are just going to get worse eventually. So uh, a great example of this is like a performance issue with an employee. Probably performance is going to continue to get bad if you don't have a difficult conversation about their performance. Personally, like a new neighbor moved in and they have a dog that will not stop barking all night long. Do you as the neighbor go over to their front door and say, hey, I want to talk about your dog? Do you avoid it? Hope it goes away? Um, typically, the dog is just going to keep barking, so you might just want to have that difficult conversation. So these are all situations that we're going to be in, um, and a lot of times it's around relationships. So why do we need to have difficult conversations? Well. We need to address, obviously, sensitive pressing issues, resolve conflicts. Um, it really help us gain a deeper understanding of others. Once you have that uh, difficult conversation, um, you're going to improve relationships and you're going to have a lot of personal growth. So one of the things I recommend is like, if you're thinking about maybe not having a difficult conversation, I'll walk you through a framework which will help you kind of understand if you should have that, that conversation or not. But oftentimes you're going to find you probably want to have the conversation. So what are some ingredients of difficult conversations? First and foremost, we all have different perceptions, right? We think we're right and the other person is wrong. <laughs> That's the big one, right? Um, we have different information about the same issue um, and we also have different interpretations about that same issue. There's also something about in assumptions, right? About intent. One thing that's important is like, unless someone explicitly states their intention, we really can't know their intention, right? Um, and we may feel intentionally hurt by the other person, but this also may be an incorrect assumption. Maybe that person really didn't want to hurt us, right? but often feelings and blame are involved. So we feel very passionate about a situation or about an argument that happened and we let emotion take over. We get angry, we yell, we scream, right? Those are all negative things, right? And then we make judgments, right? Which we'd already talked about being judgmental. Um, this never ends well in difficult conversations. So here's a strategy for how you handle a difficult conversation. First of all, you gotta make it safe to talk. And the way that you do that is um, by embracing a mutual purpose and offering mutual respect to the other person. And I know this can be hard, right? Um, one way to do this is by using what's called a contrasting statement. So you state the message you are not trying to send, then state the message you are trying to send. So for example, I am not trying to say that my project is more important than yours, I am trying to communicate that we both have high stakes involved in terms of the success of our project. That sounds much better. That is a much more safe entry into that difficult conversation. Second is listen, right? So seek first to understand and then to be understood is a great quote, right? That's about showing empathy. And you want to quiet your own internal voice, that angry voice inside that's saying like, I know I'm right and that other person is wrong. And you need to express how you are feeling, but you need to do it in the right way. So for example, you might want to say, I, I want to hear what you have to say, but to be honest, I'm feeling a little defensive right now. That actually is much better to state and saying like something else that's going to anger the other person. You also do this by open, asking open-ended questions. So tell me more, help me understand. Paraphrase, I've already mentioned the importance of paraphrasing. Repeat back to them what you're hearing. Acknowledge your feelings. 
says things like, I can tell you feel hurt when I said those things to you. Those can all go a long way. Adopt the yes and. So think about, um, you don't always have to give up your position, even if you feel very passionate about your position. You can feel hurt and angry, but also think about that they can feel equally hurt and angry. So you wanna validate both views of a situation. Recognize your story and separate impact from intent. So are we sure about what actually happened, right? Could we be making conclusions or assumptions? We might be. So you wanna ask yourself these three questions. So what did the other person actually say or do, right? Think about it. What is the impact of this on me? How do I really feel about it? And then based on the impact, what assumptions am I making about the other person's intent? So those are those three questions you always wanna go into a difficult, before you go into the difficult conversation and really think about that. I messages. So you want to start uh, a statement with, you never, never want to start a statement with you. This always comes across as accusatory and blaming, and it always puts the person on the defense whenever you start with you. So for example, you just kept rambling on in that meeting versus I didn't understand you in that meeting. Help me, uh, help me hear what I'm missing is a much better approach and does not put a person on the defense. And then focus on contribution, not blame. So there may be situations where both parties contributed to the problem. We want to call that out and identify it. So how can we learn from it and not repeat what we did next time? So conclusions. So we all have a unique way of receiving communication. And that's why it's so important that we understand the personality type of others, but also our own. So I encourage everyone to go out and learn more about personality. Each person on your team has a different way of, of being motivated, so do we, and we have to find out or we have to ask what motivates them individually. Showing true empathy, very difficult, but it's so important and we can all learn to be more empath empathetic. It takes time, it takes effort, but we can all do it. Change is hard. There's a lot of change going on in the world. There's a lot of change going on in our industry, but we've got to navigate our teams and ourselves through those six uh, stages of the change cycle. Conflicts are often because of a lack of information from one side or the other, and we often make assumptions about intent. So really go through that strategy. Um, you know, plan before you actually have the difficult conversation. So rehearse, just like anything, practice it, rehearse it, think about the conversation you're about to have. Don't just jump into a difficult conversation without preparing for it. And lastly, like I said, we all need to have those difficult conversations. Just don't ignore them. They often just end up getting worse. So a few recommended reading um, and uh, listening, of course. Um, this is the book I mentioned, Difficult Conversations, How to Discuss What Matters Most. I think it's the best book I've read on difficult conversations. Highly recommend it. The other uh, podcast I recommend is Cyber Empathy Podcast with the wonderful Andra Zaharia. Um, I have gotten so much out of this podcast. She really talks about empathy as it relates to the cybersecurity industry, and it's fantastic. Highly recommend it. Um, you could scan this QR code. It is not malicious. I know this is a hacking conference, but I promise you it goes to my blog and nowhere else. Um, but this has a full list of all of the links, book references, everything in the uh, presentation um, that you can check out. So with that, I think I'm right at time. So I'll take questions, kind of, I'll be around here mingling a bit, but uh, thank you all for, for coming out. Um, you can find me on X. It's, it's, it's not Twitter, sorry. I didn't change it, Elon did, but I'm probably more on Mastodon, but I'm Agent 0x0 on both, and then that's my blog and my podcast. So thanks everyone, appreciate you. <laughs>